as we proceed to investigate our forms of knowledge that have come down to us from the past, we become aware that our forefathers had a tendency to group uh, various types of phenomena without due consideration for the possibility of variant causes. It was their general thinking that a broad area of similar effects could be attributed to a single cause. And as a result of that, we still have much to do in the search for the several answers which bear upon conditions apparently similar. We are trying to find the reasons for things. And many things which appear the same have different reasons or different degrees of reason behind them. This applies not only to physical health, but to a number of other situations. Not so many years ago, for example, we considered the common cold and its various phases to be one ailment. Now we strongly suspect that there are many ailments involved. The symptoms are similar, but the causes of these symptoms are not identical. The same applies to the problem of dream phenomena. There can be more than one reason for a certain type of dream. There can be more than one explanation for what we would now regard as a small group of related experiences. Therefore, when we come to consider the premonitional type of dream, the dream that seems to have within it a warning of some nature. And this dream proves to be prophetically accurate. We immediately try to pin down one explanation that will explain all of the mystery. This we cannot factually do. And therefore, under the general heading this evening, we have to examine a number of related possible causes for what appears to be a very single and definite occurrence. Premonitional dreams and things of this nature arise from one broad group of causes and from other groups also, but let us consider one group first, but not as the exclusive group. One group arises in man's natural tendency to be fearful. There is something within our nature, particularly if we are depressed or have a tendency to be neurotic or to suffer from some psychological pressure, there is a tendency for us to expect the unfortunate. This expectation passes through a number of different degrees according to the temperament of the individual. Nearly all warning dreams and most prophetic dreams have a tendency to center upon disaster or uh, trouble of some kind. We are not likely to prophesy something in the form of an unexpected good. We are more likely uh, to be afraid of an impending evil. Taking, for example, say a hundred dreams or experiences or even strong intuitional pressures about something. We can come up with quite a variety of calamity warnings or forebodings. In the course of years, for example, there has been a large group of dreams 
relating to natural disaster. Almost every year, someone predicts a disastrous earthquake or flood. We have, for instance, been suffering for the last 50 years from a continuously maintained prophecy, for example, concerning the possible submergence of the entire Atlantic seaboard of the United States. We have also gone through countless uh, occasions with people relating to more immediate disasters. There is hardly a mail that comes today that does not bring some worried question about whether a bomb will drop on Paducah or whether uh, the Mississippi is going to overflow and become an ocean. This type of thinking is proverbial. Uh, for the last 2,000 years, we have had proverbial and regular end-of-the-world frights and fears. These are often accompanied by dreams. Sometimes they are forewarned by dreams. Now, what is the possibility of this type of dream? But before we go into that, one other point I, would, I should make. Up to the present time, probably 95% of these dreams of portending disaster are not fulfilled. The majority of the incidents predicted do not occur. Yet the individual finding that they do not occur seems to lose no enthusiasm for his tendency, and having failed in one prediction makes two more. Of course, in many instances, uh, predictions or forewarnings, if held long enough about a certain condition or in relation to a certain probability, may very well ultimately be fulfilled. I know that for nearly 20 years, a well-known English prophet annually announced the death of King George V. In the 20th year, he was right. And of course, under those conditions, the preceding 19 years were merely minor errors in calculation. The uh, principle remained untouched as far as this person was concerned, and he promptly went to work predicting the death of the next king. This type of situation seems to indicate a man's natural tendency, under certain conditions, to fall into very negative attitudes. Now, we also must bear in mind that many persons coming under the influence of rather morbid statements may carefully nourish them and later release them as part of their own psychological pressure. We read something, we hear something, and because it is direful, it sort of clings to us because perhaps we have a slight tendency to the same attitude. In time, this subconsciously accepted uh, prophecy or premonition or record uh, comes out again as though it originated in ourselves, or perhaps originated in some large circumstance. If it comes out as a remembrance of our original source of information, it makes no serious situation. But if it suddenly takes visual form and appears as a vision, or in a dream sequence, it suddenly seems to be more important. The majority of this type of dream is not fulfilled. It represents, as we say, a tendency obviously psychological to have a sense of impending trouble. It can be based, of course, on broad generalities of life. The individual whose life has been troubled may broadly assume that his future will be troubled and persons in various anxieties 
can precipitate these anxieties as formulas and become even more depressed as the result. I think, therefore, that we must assume that one cause or source of the so-called premonitional uh, announcement of evil arises in our natural subconscious expectancy of trouble. And if we become less optimistic, if our own psychological balance is depressed in one way or another, uh, this possibility of trouble is magnified and augmented. Another type bearing closely upon this one is that the individual develops some kind of a religious or philosophical fixation relating to the possibility of trouble and that this uh, fixation becomes too dominant in his own life. We, knew for, we know, for example, that medieval man was under the opinion uh, that the world might end at any moment. And as uh, various millennial ethics arose, which seemed possibly to coincide with this thinking, these persons did have vision. They did see what might be considered the last judgment. They beheld mysterious spectacles in the air and in their own psyches, which looked like the end of the world. But this type of premonition arose very clearly from religious conviction, intensified by the corroboration of others of similar conviction and even by the preachments of respected authorities. Thus, if a fear mechanism is implanted in man, he has a tendency to enlarge upon it, uh, to become continually expectant toward some negative circumstance. This type of premonitional warning has really no essential, essential validity. It simply is the individual interpreting circumstances from a negative point of view, or perhaps taking on some formula and working with it a little too desperately. We know, for example, that for a number of years, pyramid prophecies were attempted. Uh, these uh, were based upon certain calculations that it was assumed had been incorporated into the structure of the Great Pyramid of Giza. And in measuring these various uh, areas and combinations of mathematical patterns, uh, efforts were made, or believed to be made, uh, to indicate major changes in human affairs. War, disaster, floods, um, collapses of civilizations and cultures were based upon myths, scratches, small holes, and uh, varying grains in the stone of the wall of the inner passageway of the pyramid. Obviously, you had to believe the basic premise in order to read the uh, story as the author explained it or interpreted it. But many people became very fearful over some of these impending possibilities, and fearfulness in turn affecting the subconscious cause visual uh, occurrences in sleep, seemingly to sustain this particular point of view. Now, the juxtaposition of a premonition or a fear in relationship uh, to world events means that in a certain percentage of cases, this type of dream would have a measure of fulfillment. If we expect certain things and interpret out of ourselves the intensities of world situations, something within ourselves, if it is only common sense, will indicate that many of our courses of action would reasonably lead to serious difficulties. We may therefore become fearful of things obvious and reasonable, and then dramatize this fearfulness 
in the shape of some impending or presumed disaster. There is a certain degree of fulfillment always, because if we predict that man will be in trouble, he cannot be wrong very long. He has a decided tendency to get into trouble, and it hardly requires a psychic perception to realize that many of our actions can only end in trouble. Thus, perhaps, we are secretly telling ourselves the kind of consequences that are inherent in our own actions. This type of explanation, however, does not cover the entire ground by any means. But it does, perhaps, cover a certain superficial group of conditions which are present and which undoubtedly are responsible for the fact that so many of these predictions fail utterly to materialize, and also to explain why so many important events go unpredicted. This is a, a situation which we cannot deny. I know individuals, for example, who spent practically every hour of their sleeping time dramatizing uh, impending trouble and yet missed entirely a very serious one uh, that occurred in the course of their uh, period of dramatization. The same thing occurs in so-called psychic situations. Uh, I know an individual, for example, who really believed that psychically he was in tune with just about everything. He announced wars and pestilences and plagues and uh, practically every type of disaster. But he was sitting in Long Beach when the earthquake occurred there, and he hadn't the slightest idea it was coming. He missed a very good bet, which he might otherwise have been able to use to prove his point. So many things predicted do not occur, and many things which no one anticipates actually happen. For this reason, we must doubt a certain area of this type of occurrence. Now we pass from that to perhaps the second type. But in order to explain this type, we must uh, philosophize a little more about man. One of the reasons, perhaps, why the individual is a little pessimistic and inclined to feel that evil is ever nigh unto him, is because down inside the deepest parts of his own conscience, he has decided that he is honestly entitled to trouble. He knows that he himself has so conducted his own affairs uh, that they are not in order, not secure, and are therefore subject uh, to innumerable shocks. Consciously, we may defend against this, but subconsciously, uh, the truth will out. And persons who have planned badly, invested poorly, uh, been imposed upon too easily, inwardly realize that this type of circumstance must cause trouble ultimately. Consequently, they may warn themselves. They cannot warn themselves consciously because most persons are unwilling to admit in their conscious moves that they make mistakes. But the subconscious part of them, which is a little more honest and a better record keeper, will very often warn them uh, of impending inevitable. And as the uh, dream symbolism is seldom literal, uh, the dream that accompanies this type of warning will be emblematic and will present one kind of a disaster to conceal or imply another. A person whose investments are going badly may dream that he is drowning in a very stormy sea. What nature is trying to tell him is that he is insecure, that the things he is doing, the things he is doing are not according to his own common sense. 
but he has come under the glamour of the hope of high reward for small effort, and this is more than his conscious mind can safely combat. Therefore, consciously he goes on his way, hoping against hope. But inside of each of us is a realist that can and does face facts. This realist may whisper in our ears that trouble is approaching. And in order to tell us this, it may have to use some almost psychic means due to the locking of our objective attitude. Most persons are much more set in their ways than they realize. And having done something badly, they must defend their own action. They must justify themselves. And in this process of building elaborate intellectual, intellectual protections against their own failings, they become so burdened with false thinking that they cannot see clearly or straighten out the tangled chain of circumstances. But the subconscious part of man, because it is not so glamorized, may in time or in the course of the situation come out with the facts. This leads us to suspect that there is a fact finder in man. It represents a level of detached judgment uh, which is not always available to him in his normal conduct. It is there, however, and it is one of the reasons why uh, the best thinking that we do must be done when we are in a state of internal composure. The stresses through which we pass, pass nearly always afflict our ability to see clearly. And the word clairvoyance means basically to see clearly. Now to see clearly on a rational level alone is to appear to possess supernatural power. If we ever use our faculties as they were intended to be used, we become rather intelligent creatures. And the intelligent creature can weigh and estimate the consequences of action. As we lock ourselves away from this simple intelligence, uh, we overlook important truths that should be Im immediately available to us. Someone came to me with a dream that worried them very gravely. They had two sons, fine upcoming young men. And one night, uh, this person had the dream that these two sons were coming home or returning to the family for some celebration, such as Christmas or Thanksgiving. And along the way, they passed through a serious storm. And in this storm, the ground became very treacherous. And in this treacherous quicksand-like ground, these two boys sank and died. Naturally, the parent was gravely perturbed and wondered whether this was a true warning that these boys' lives were in danger. In the course of some months, no factual incident to corroborate the dream occurred. In fact, none ever occurred. And that was a number of years ago. But what was happening was different. This mother was an extremely possessive uh, person, well-intentioned in every way, but instinctively uh, holding on too firmly upon the lives of these two young men. Apparently, this symbolism of coming back to the family for a celebration was a fulfillment of the mother's desire to prevent these two boys from going out into the world and living their own lives. She wanted them to come back. He wanted to continually protect them and to supply them and to spoil them. And as a result of that, uh, she was preparing to drown them in the quicksand of her own emotional possessiveness. Something inside of her was telling her that if these boys came back, returned again to her influence, 
they would be at storm, a struggle for their own independence, and that finally their individuality would be destroyed and they would sink into this quicksand of the acceptances of her domination. This was being told to her by her own inner insight. Yet in her conscious mind, she was so desirous of continuing to have the pleasure of trying in her way to direct these young men that she did not for a moment suspect that anything that she could wish for them, anything she could do for them or to them, could hurt them in any way. Yet she was on the very edge of causing them to lose their individual existence. Later, this proved to be true. And when a conflict did arise, and one of these young men wished to get married, the mother developed an intense hysteria over the whole thing. The dream became meaningful, and when interpreted, the real fact began to reveal themselves, and fortunately the mother was able to sense this meaning, which she knew inside was true, and took hold of herself and uh, prevented the psychological uh, drowning of these young men. So that the dream uh, warned something. It was a premonition, but it was not a literal or factual this is a very important guide because it so serves two purposes. First, it shows that the dream does have a meaning. The second is it protects us from the danger of literalizing the symbolism and then feeling that there was no meaning because the physical events do not occur. Just as the mass is ill fortune dream simply signifies the negativeness in ourselves. So many particular dreams indicate our tendencies, habits, or things we are doing which are leading us into trouble. Most persons in the course of life sense when something is wrong. Yet in this sensing, they do not clearly uh, analyze the situation and honestly react to it in a normal manner. They become highly defensive and protective. They bring out more and more energy to sustain their own purpose, thus hastening what uh, the dream intimates as a calamity of some kind. If then we have dreams that relate uh, to some emergency, to those around us, we should do very well to understand our relationship with these other persons, to discover, if possible, what kind of an adroit scheme we are holding in relation to those persons. Well, usually there is a little scheme of some kind, a scheme which to us is perfectly reasonable and normal a scheme which we do not sense as dishonest, but which perhaps is ethically not really honest. It is much of the same type of thing as intense competitiveness in business. We justify competition because apparently everyone practices it, and without it we are unable to survive. In the name of competition, we do things that are not ethically correct. At the same time, we may break no physical law, nor subject ourselves to any legal action. We are just not quite honest. And in personal relationships, this is a very common circumstance. We do not honestly estimate that which we too greatly love. We do not honestly estimate that which we too deeply hate. Wherever the emotions and attitudes and imaginations of the individual become involved, common sense, factual thinking, realization and reality 
depart. The only way that we can perhaps save ourselves from the consequences is to listen to the internal value uh, that lies locked in our own soul. If, for example, we have been taught by our religion or hold it to be true by our conviction that a certain measure of unselfishness is necessary for a truly moral, ethical life, and we become too selfish in our relationship, then the psychological disturbance resulting from this may cause symbolic dreams. The dream in this case, then, is a conflict dream, a dream between two levels of our own understanding, a, a dream in which compromise is exposed in its true light as being unfair or unreasonable or unkind, even though we may consciously deny such to be the case. Therefore, I think we must acknowledge or respect the fact that the average person is more honest when he relaxes than when he is under tension. Tension creates a kind of moral astigmatism. The individual easily overlo overlooks principles when his own interests are involved. Yet psychologically, man is striving for internal health. Nature wishes to maintain his equilibrium. Nature wants the person to be right. And rightness, in this case, is that this person shall be true to himself as he understands himself that he shall make no compromise that is detrimental to his peace of mind, his emotional integrity, or his physical health. Under these conditions, the internal or subconscious part of man becomes an instructor, more or less giving advice, mildly correcting or chastising, or if the condition is very imminent and urgent, coming forth very firmly with some warning, a warning that arises from the result of man's inward life becoming too inconsistent, too divided, and to that degree endangering the total unity or integration of the personality. This leads to the next situation. Uh, we know that there are what are called prodromic dreams. These are the symptomological dreams. They are known to exist. The individual, in various degrees of health problems, does dream in a diagnostic way. Some way, the internal chemistry of man, particularly when this chemistry has been attacked by the inroads of disease, affects the entire psychic life. Sickness not consciously felt in the body is already subconsciously felt in the psyche. One of the reasons for this may well be that disturbance of the psyche is the cause of the sickness. And this disturbance, which has perhaps remained for some time on the psychological level, begins to intrude itself upon physical function or structure. This uh, increasing hazard uh, to the total integration of the person creates psychological, mental, emotional stress patterns of a peculiar nature. These patterns can become intuitively known. They can be sensed before they occur. Inasmuch as a symptom, for example, uh, will announce perhaps more than the symptom itself implies, because the symptom carries with it the overtone of what will occur if the symptom is not corrected. It is a warning, and once it appears and is adequately diagnosed, the whole cause, uh, course of an ailment can be anticipated. Therefore, a symptom may arise early, 
and usually symptoms do arise in time for the individual to take some kind of step if the symptom is duly noted. Psychologically, symptoms are known uh, uh, earlier than they are physically. The physical system, even though it is extremely sensitive, is not in nearly as sensitive as the psychic organism. And by the time certain uh, symptoms have worked their way out into our physical objective consciousness and we become aware of them, by that time a great deal of symptomology has already occurred that was cognized only by the subconscious part of ourselves. I think this may have been one of the uh, explanations of the old clinics of the god Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. These clinics strongly emphasize dream diagnosis, and the patient who was brought into the temple, given a sleeping herb of some kind, a narcotic, a mild one, and then in his sleep, the deity seemed to appear to him and diagnose the ailment. Also, sometimes uh, recommending strongly the therapy indicated. Primarily, this undoubtedly was the unlocking of man's own interior power to know the condition of himself. When this has to break through in dreams again, it may very well do so symbolically. The, the, the event may not be exactly what the dream seems to mean, but there is a valid relationship capable of interpretation. A classic example of that, which I have mentioned uh, in uh, some of our writings, is the story of the man who had the dream that he was swimming in an ocean of blood and a few days later had a very dangerous hemorrhage. This particular dream certainly was a diagnostic one. The psyche knew what was coming because the causes of this circumstance were already at work within the body, although the person was not aware of it. One of the reasons why the psyche might have had this awareness is because the psyche was able to judge the nature of the person, the nature of his actions, his previous conduct in certain matters, perhaps habits or practices that weakened the body, or some previous sudden exertion which endangered the body and made this hemorrhage especially likely. Also the possibility of the psyche picking up a matter of infection, or a matter of the gradual development of a disease within the body that the conscious person had not yet realized. Consequently, there is not only in this case the personal factor of a subconscious with an awareness beyond the conscious, and the fact that awareness bestows an increasing area of prophetic power. We call it prophecy, but actually it is awareness of facts, present or impending. Facts that have perfectly mathematical formulas and are developing and unfolding in natural sequences which can therefore be examined by anyone who has the interior insight to make the examination. Many people do not make the examination. Many persons being afraid that their symptoms may mean something, disregard them in order to preserve for a little while the freedom from the oppression of an unhappy diagnosis. But the psyche senses all of these things. We may also note very definitely uh, what is now coming to be more recognized and which we have talked about for so many years namely that we must consider nations and races and collective groups as uh, individual psyches. 
we must face the psychopolitical fact that the folk or the people of a unit or culture group constitute a psychological entity. These people may not be consciously aware of a course of circumstances affecting their country or affecting their nation or their race or their culture. But there is no reason to say that the subconscious of these groups, that this subconscious nature is not aware of the inevitable consequences of group policy, and that the attitudes of people, their intolerance, or their various pressures, these will in turn affect the political life of these people. And on the same basis as the prodromic dream, there is no reason to doubt that predictions about nations can be made, predictions which seem fantastic, and yet which arise not in a miracle or in some unknown sensory perception, but simply arise from the fact that man is capable of greater thoughtfulness in these matters than he realizes, and that this greater thoughtfulness is nearly always obscured by some superficial false thinking of his own. Thus denying the hazards, denying the dangers, or ignoring them, he permits them to gather around him and increase, and he strengthens the dangers until finally the psychic integration breaks through with some kind of a warning. Nature has a tendency to warn things. Nature does not wish them to fall into disaster. In fact, a large part of the sensory structure of man is defensive, intended to assist him in the protect, protection of his life and his liberty and his happiness. It is his own tendency, tendency to ignore this helpful part that nature has provided that causes him to have more and more trouble. Nature trying to break through with one of these prophetic experiences usually chooses the sleep period. Although under certain stress, Nature may assert itself even in waking hours. But the sleep period merely means the period in which the self-will of the individual is subordinated. These experiences, which may be a clear statement of a real truth, these experiences come when the defense mechanism of opinion and attitude have been temporarily uh, suspended. Thus, we have the uh, extended realization that as sleep merely represents the temporary relief from psychic stress, that the person in his daily living who can consciously relieve himself of this stress can relax and become quietly, thoughtfully receptive to basic ideas. Uh, will usually be able to discover what he needs to know. And it is the tension under which we operate that actually permits us to make mistakes. If we were relaxed, if we were thoughtful, if we were uh, conscientious in our tracing through the pattern of our own conduct, we would be able to save ourselves innumerable uh, tragic hours. Uh, we have the power, but now this power only operates when we get out of the way of our own self-interest, which is a false self-interest because it is not helping us, it is hurting us. It is merely fulfilling our desire. It is not supporting our needs. This leads us to another possible level of the explanation of this type of phenomena. We have not yet approached anything that resembles the mystical or the mysterious. We know that certain persons, highly trained, recognize ailments more quickly than those untrained. And these ailments not only mean physical ones, but anything which has a tendency to disturb the order of our lives, 
or endanger the normalcy of our existence. We know that it is perfectly possible to detect uh, from the general structure of a person, from his reactions to certain tests, how he is likely to fare in this world. We know that if he flunks certain tests, he will have troubles throughout life. The troubles are not the result of flunking the test. The troubles are the result of the condition of himself. And the flunking of the test is merely a demonstration of his own condition. Thus the entire psychic integration of the individual as he is gives us a very clear and concise insight as to what is most likely to happen to him. And because the details of his character help to define the details of events likely to occur, we can come very close to a remarkably accurate prophecy about someone, merely as a result of the daily exhibition that that person makes of the attributes of his disposition. We know that certain attitudes will have certain consequences. We may not be able to date the consequences, but we are fully aware that it will occur. And sometimes it occurs more rapidly than we realize. This being due in turn to the fact that often, because we are not greatly observant, we do not notice the symptoms until they are very pronounced. And the more pronounced the symptom, the more rapidly the consequence will be manifested. If we could uh, perceive the symptom at its very beginning, we might be able to say it will be ten years before this symptom will produce any more effect. But if we are already eight years along the process of this symptom building up, before it becomes sufficiently clear for us to sense, then the symptoms will produce their consequences in two years because it is measured from the time in which we become aware of them. The most satisfactory solution to this whole problem, of course, and the lesson that it tries to teach us, is that we should search for these indications ourselves, that we should become as mindful as we can not in terms of watching for impending trouble, but in becoming keenly aware of processes which can cause trouble, correcting them ourselves, and placing a long-range strategy in our minds. We so frequently forget that time passes rapidly, and an individual at 20 told that a certain course of action will make him ill at 40, is very likely to say, well, remind me at 39 and I'll do something about it. This is our thinking. After all, we have 20 years to do as we please, and then we can start a new strategy of some kind. So we do not uh, give very immediate thought to remote happenings. But these 20 years go by with unbelievable rapidity, and suddenly that impending event has lived its life and has come to its fruition, and suddenly we are faced with it. By that time, it may have progressed to a degree we can do very little about it. This putting off of necessary changes in ourselves is a very false way uh, to seek pleasure, happiness, or comfort, because these purposes of nature will undoubtedly uh, assert themselves with almost mathematical finality. All these processes we sense, we are only now beginning to place them into the terms of a science. Only now are we permitting the things we have known and always known. Uh, to have a distinct part in the regulation of our outward affairs. The process is still in its infancy, but we are, we are gaining on it gradually. 
the psychosomatic relationship between certain policies and health, or the relationship between character and the probabilities, for example, of successful marriage, the relationship between inner maturity and our ability to direct the lives of our children, these things are certain and factual. But we are not always willing to face them. Uh, but subconsciously, they build up toward their own inevitable conclusions. Most of our psychic stress is due to this conflict between the surface purposes of the individual and the subconscious facts which are constantly trying to impress him, trying to come through into consciousness in order that he may take advantage of the truth that they reveal. Now, there are several other possible degrees to be considered here. There are other phases of this matter, influence from other persons, and how this influence may appear through dreams to be prophetic. But uh, all in all, the average person who comes under dream analysis or deals with this phase of his own inner life is not essentially a prophet. He is not basically a mystic, no matter what he wants to think about this. He is really a person uh, of comparatively imperfect attainment, who is in need of immediate help in the most simple and commonplace occurrences. The individual who thinks he is far beyond uh, these problems of ordinary mortals, suddenly finds himself confronted with a broken home or sees his business evaporating through poor management. It has not occurred to him that such things could happen to him. He believes that he has gone far beyond this in his internal insight, but he has falsely weighed his own attainment. And I think it is wise in the view of this to assume that the average person does not have available extrasensory faculties which may normally be the explanation of unusual occurrences. What he calls extrasensory faculties are really his own true faculties which he has not been willing to acknowledge or which he has misinterpreted. And the voice that comes is not the voice of an angel. It is the voice of his own desperately afflicted nature, trying to correct him, trying to bring him in line with reality, trying to help him uh, to find himself in the midst of erroneous uh, conclusions about himself, which, if continued, would merely get him further and further into trouble. This type can be examined and amplified and books can be written relating to these phases of the situation. But we must also bear in mind that there are certain evidences of premonitional, premonitional or warning experiences which do not con conveniently fit into these suggest suggested uh, causations. There are others which bear upon other values. One of the most difficult of these to analyze is the so-called dated dream, or the vision in which an occurrence, an occurrence is clearly located in its time sequence. An individual has a certain kind of dream that is not essentially personal. A dream uh, perhaps such as that of a small boy who had a very clear and vivid dream of the great earthquake disaster at Martinique years ago. This child sat up in the night screaming and described the occurrence. And a day or two later, Martinique was struck exactly as this boy had seen. Now, he had no interest in Martinique. He probably did not know it existed. He had no reason to suddenly become so highly sensitive 
and to prevision even the details of this disaster. Our psychological explanation of this, such as we have previously advanced, is simply not adequate. On the other hand, the explanation for this type of uh, prognostic dream should not be merely enlarged and made to cover all the others. The fact that this boy had undoubtedly an authentic example of premonitional dreams does not mean that all other dreams are authentically premonitional, nor that the faculties used by this boy are the same faculties that are used by the individual in a dream of another disaster which does not occur. We must face, therefore, that dream phenomena of this nature can arise from several causes. And we must try to analyze a little, at least, the genuine prophetic dream, which, as far as we can determine, cannot be explained by psychic disturbance within the person. This type of dream is usually impersonal, but it can also be personal. But where it is personal, it is so exact that the individual, uh, whether he accepts the dream or not, will nearly always experience what it suggests. This type of prophetic dream also has a different dimension in its presentation. The truly prophetic dream usually is not symbolical. It is literal. It describes the event exactly as it is. It is not something that is forced to fight its way through the symbol-making mechanism of our own consciousness. And from the general study of it and what its procedures seem to be, there is much to indicate that it represents a direct impact from some source outside of the psychic mechanism of the individual. This, of course, leads immediately to the psychological consideration of such things as telepathy, extrasensory perception, the possibility of true and valid foreknowledge about events which are to occur. Now, the foreknowledge type of dream suggests, again, more than one possible explanation. The foreknowledge type of dream can be like the one which we mentioned of the man who dreamed that he was in or was swimming in the sea of blood, and the hemorrhage followed a few days later. Now, this is a microcosmic example, a little example, of a dream which was prophetic, though not entirely literal, yet so nearly literal. Uh, that even the element of blood appears as a clue to the entire situation. This has to mean that in the life of that person, his own inner consciousness had become aware of a situation that was impending. Therefore, there must be the planets do not cause the disaster, but they precipitate it just exactly as a person under a certain type of stress may have a long enduring tendency to a thrombosis. This thrombosis could occur or can occur any time once it is established as a probability. Yet the occurring of the thrombosis can be determined from a horoscope, because the situation which precipitates it must involve some stress or strain, some immediate situation that precipitates into fact the long-existing tendency. Now, it is conceivable that man is sufficiently sensitive to these psychic influences or to these groupings 
of planetary force that he can become aware within himself of the pattern which is going to affect something else. In other words, he can sense or feel or experience without mentation the qualities of the pressure or massing of planetary rays. If nature uh, can precipitate events by these patterns, man can intuit these patterns. Thus he, with, he becomes a, a subconscious or unconscious estimator of the vibrations in the atmosphere around him and the probable intensities of these vibrations. And as these vibrations in turn are localized on the principles of geodetic equivalence, he may even be aware of the area in which these vibrations will center. Perhaps the simplest way would be to assume that there is in man a seer, inwardly capable of contemplating these patterns. And just as he can train himself outwardly to read, in some degree of accuracy, the relations of the stars in a, in a nativity, so subconsciously perhaps he could read them even better without even knowing what he is doing. He simply receives the pure impact of the archetypal energy itself and then proceeds to differentiate this energy in himself uh, discovering in the process the meaning of the energy. Now, this might seem a rather circuitous way of doing it, but there is no doubt in the world uh, that human beings have been able to intuit these things. And there is also no doubt in the world that most so-called forms of fortune telling, uh, whether they be according to the Yi Ging of the Chinese, or according to the geomancy practiced by the old Roman soldiers, or perhaps according to the uh, cartomancy or card reading of someone like Madame, Mademoiselle Lenormand, that in some way these mechanical things, the cards, the dice, all of these symbols that are used in divination, they have to be interpreted and the interpretation of them arises not in themselves, but in the person who interprets them. In the same way, one physician may be extremely intuitive in his diagnosis, so intuitive that there is really little need for him to make use of laboratory facilities at all. He senses uh, the type of problem the sick person is suffering from. Other physicians do not possess this sensitivity, at least not conscious, and must depend upon laboratory reports. The tendency in medicine, however, is that the practitioner, who is sympathetic, understanding, and is largely dominated by the true principles of healing, will, through the course of years, intensify his own sensitivity. He will start out with very heavy dependence upon formalized methods, book forms of diagnosis, or laboratory reports. But having treated many who were sick, having carried many ailments through their various stages, he gradually develops an interior power to estimate what is to occur or what is wrong. It is quite conceivable by the same procedure uh, that this uh, rapport, this sensitivity, this high specialization may lead to a kind of clear ascension on many levels, including world prophecy. The seer who is always responsive to the psychic forces around him and who therefore, in a rather relaxed manner, cast the dice or drop uh, the little sticks of Chinese divination, immediately mysteriously sees symbols as 
and he used to see them in the uh, teacup. Uh, you will see a group of tea leaves, and they looked exactly like nothing. But Andy had no difficulty whatever in proclaiming that that pattern was a kindly-looking elephant. Another individual looking at the same pattern said, it does not look like an elephant to me. What it really looks to me like is a cat sitting on its hind legs. Then Andy will argue, no, it just isn't. You're just not seeing it right. And this can go on for hours. Yet Andy, because of her intuitiveness, is actually dreaming awake. She is imposing from within herself a meaning. And if she is sufficiently sensitive, her meaning may be correct. Because she, again, is sensitive to something. The force or pressure in life which is moving events. This means that there must be and there is in nature, as in man, some pattern which can be diagnosed. Not, nature cannot be merely blind forces moving blindly. If such were the case, no prediction could be made. There has to be a pattern a scientific unfoldment of archetypes by means of which it is possible for a sensitive person to tune in to one of these patterns. Now the next thing that comes to mind in all of this situation is a little different but has a bearing upon this. We assume that man's physical body is a sort of mirror in which his psychic life is reflected, so that his physical personality becomes the extension of a series of causal factors behind it. Let us assume for a moment that the physical earth is such a body, but that this earth is really the visible part of an elaborate structure, and that the invisible parts of this structure corresponds to the emotional, mental, and psychic life of man. Therefore, that predisposition to various physical conditions lie within the invisible parts of a structure. That what we would call, therefore, a physical circumstance arises from a series of invisible factors that these factors group. And when this group of factors becomes sufficiently dominant, then the physical body or the earth body will receive uh, this impression and will be molded or modified accordingly. Thus things happening in the visible nature of things have an antecedent existence. They are existing through the process of becoming what they are. And things do not simply happen. They are motions of values moving into a precipitate state. They are gradually intensifying and intensifying until they become uh, factual or dominant in the material world. Let us use another parallel for this. An individual develops a habit. This habit is a kind of luxury of his thinking or of his emotions. He starts out, perhaps, with a pretty decent disposition. And then he begins to fall into a habit. A habit meaning a non-resistance to some negative factor in his own personality. And first, do you know, he nags a little. Well, anyone can nag a little. Most people do. Most persons who never gain reputation for nagging have occasionally indulged in it. But this particular individual found also within his psychic nature a tendency to be habit-ridden. And the nagging which might have only been very occasional in another person produced immediate results which seemed to fascinate this 
habit-prone person. He nagged a little. He got what he wanted, like a child. This individual found that when he kept on pressing himself or his point, other people said, oh, well, let's do it his way if he wants it that way. So he won. Well, having won by a negative action that is not especially meritorious, and having a natural tendency to be habit-ridden, this person really developed into a first-class nagger. At first, they nagged once a year. A little later, they nagged once a month. A little later still, once a day. And finally, all the time. Finally, they could no longer turn it on or off. It was no longer an expedient nagging. At the beginning, the individual nagged just at the times when it would do him the most good, or thought it would. Finally, he can't control it at all. It becomes like a habit addiction. It becomes a, a tremendous pressure. And all his willpower cannot get him over this instinctive habit. It may destroy many values for him, but he can't stop it. Now, this has all been building something for a long time. For perhaps most of a considerable period, this nagging uh, produced no visible result, except perhaps occasionally he got what he wanted. But after many years of this problem, the crisis came. The family got tired of it. And perhaps some very slight little nag, just at the critical moment, and this individual's family left him. The action finally occurred one afternoon. But the cause of it had been building for 20 years. But there was a moment in which this cause precipitated it. Now, at the beginning of the 20 years, no one, perhaps, could have foreseen where this nagging was going to lead. But six months before the break came, any good analyst could have described very immediately what was going to happen, because the reaction of all the persons had become so conditioned that it was merely a matter of time when the family would disintegrate. Tuning in at one of these later points, by subconscious means, any individual who was intuitive could have announced the broken home, and by the degree of the intensity of the situation could have said, perhaps not the day on which it would occur, but that the condition would not extend much longer, that it was only a matter of months or a year or two and it was going to happen. Everyone involved was at the breaking point. Somebody had to break. So if you could have tuned in on this process at the correct moment, you could have very well diagnosed exactly what was going to happen and probably would have gained some reputation for being a wonder worker. But these things represent patterns building up, world patterns build up. Uh, the uh, psychohistorian can see it. He realizes that a certain amount of competition a certain amount of extravagance, the continuance of unsolved problems between nations, uh, the gradual result of the industrial changes forced upon people, uh, their mingling with other nations. But ultimately, these things are going to come to a head, that something is going to break or that some major change is to occur. And if we tune in these patterns, objectively, by reason, we call our discovery of what will happen judgment. But if our conscious judgment is not up to it, but this pattern strikes against our subconscious psychic integration, it still it is judgment but it appears to us as a flash of intuition. It appears to us as a miraculous foreknowledge. But this miraculous part is simply the fact that we have not recognized that all processes in nature are natural. 
and that the miracle is merely a process which we do not understand, but which must also be natural. There is no question that in the psychological atmosphere, as in man's psycho-emotional, personal atmosphere, vast motions of world affairs are in various degrees of precipitation. There is no doubt in the world that through a proper receptivity to the degree and development of these psychic patterns, we may predict with reasonable certainty the advent of a war, and by the development and degree of the pattern, the probability of the timing of that war. We can predict national decline, depression, and things of this nature if our, uh, if our subjective faculties are able to estimate the processes which are taking place around us in life. There is one other point that is also of some value in this, and I think we must consider it. Outwardly, man is heavily influenced by tradition. He is heavily influenced by the press, by the opinions of the learned, by the words of wisdom from the wise or otherwise. He is still strongly impressed by chatter, conversation, and opinion. This uh, tendency to be over-influenced may result in his external thinking developing a pattern based upon prejudice, based upon immature judgment or the errors of other people. Five great commentators may come out and say our economic condition was never better and two weeks later a depression. By the same token, a dozen world authorities may announce that a depression is inevitable, but it doesn't happen. This, however, has an effect upon us. And in the fear of this depression, we may panic. And if enough persons are sufficiently influenced by poor judgment of other people, we may develop a depression as a result. At the same time, however, that we are building up these patterns dependent largely upon our respect for the opinions of others or our acceptance of the reports of experts or the common feeling that many people have, usually negative. Contrary to this is our own psychic integration, which may, by its own detachment, by the fact that it has an existence in itself and is subjected to other types of influence than those with which we are physically surrounded, the psychic entity may come to a completely different conclusion about this particular group of symptoms. If the psychic entity is more thorough and more mature in its thinking, it will be more right than report. Now, I know in this particular case we are on very dangerous ground because if we recommend that an individual always follow his own guidance and go contrary to the opinions of experts, we can also get him into terrible trouble. Theoretically, your expert is a trained guesser. He is an individual who has specialized in a field and probably knows as much about this field as is possible in the light of the degree of intelligence which he possesses. On the other hand, he can be wrong. He can definitely fail to take into consideration circumstances which perhaps he has not faced, or he may be over-influenced in himself by his own particular addiction to certain patterns of ideas. There are experts in this country that have been predicting a depression ever since we got out of the last one. Now, many of these experts are regarded with considerable veneration. We see around us enough symptoms to indicate that they might well be right. But someone may come along and out of a peculiar integration within himself, he may experience the fact that these men are wrong because he is looking from a viewpoint 
uh, tied to an archetypal sensitivity. And he is free from the fact that predicting a depression can also become a habit. And therefore, the individual falls into a situation in which he does not react to judgment, but reacts to prejudice. Under these situations, the inner life of the person, if it is well integrated, uh, can anticipate more wisely than an expert by the process of intuitional recognition of value. Just exactly as I know a case that occurred in which the person engaged in hiring help and labor along a railroad in our southwest was a very expert personal personnel man. He, he had been very successful in estimating the personnel that he employed. One of his laborers, a very common laborer who had never estimated much of anything, was an old Indian. One day, this personnel man hired a person as a bookkeeper. The Indian did not know what a bookkeeper was, probably. But after this man had enthusiastically hired this other man, the old Indian laborer who had been walking and standing around walked up to the personal and personnel man and he said, Excuse me, you have just hired a thief. So it proved to be. The Indian was nearer right than the man who had had many years of successful experience. The Indian had sensed something. He had an intuitive faculty, perhaps uh, belonging to his people. In any event, he was right. He had felt and known more than this other man who was working upon, uh, to a degree, working upon his former success. He had a little bit overestimated his own ability. These things happen. Children have these flashes of judgment that are, that are wiser than the parental mind. They are not too common, but they do occur. An individual living in a world in which things seem to be moving in one direction can suddenly become aware that this motion is false and that the facts are moving in an opposite direction. Such can result in an intuitional state. But all such intuition must depend upon the fact that there is something to intuit. There has to be some reason some process, some formula, some pattern existing to which the individual can attune himself. If nothing else, there must be a very highly skillful pattern within the nature of the thing about which he has a prophetic instinct. He must be able to experience something that tells him which way that event is going. And it has to be going that way, whether it appears to be or not. So then there is a religious conviction about this situation that certain prophecies are sent by divine power. That the individual, for one reason or another, will become an agent, as were the prophets of Israel, to warn the people of some event or condition which the celestial powers intend that man uh, shall know about and later experience. Therefore, that the prophetic sense is given by God to certain persons to be used in the service of God by those persons. This is a matter of very attenuated theological conviction. That such can happen, no one can question. That such does happen, we are not too sure. But there certainly appears to be a time or a condition in which vision or insight is intercessional. That it comes as though to save a situation that is utterly beyond man's ability to control. Therefore, that a sudden insight must be imparted. 
we know also that periodic expressions of such insight are recorded in the development of people. Periodically, nations, races, clans, groups become deeply involved in some situation which could have desperate results. And in these larger collective patterns, the prophetic factor is often introduced. The emergency seems to produce a prophet, and this prophet becomes the instrument of warning. He becomes the one who seems to be intended to lead a group of people out of a disaster and into a better condition beyond it. Very often this type of prophecy is of extraordinarily detailed nature and uh, was anciently held to be a power bestowed by the gods. Many of the older writers discussing this type of prophetic power held it to be the particular province of oracles, of anointed priests, of mystics, of heroes, and of divine beings sent into the world as instructors of men. Many scriptural writings contain prophecies. Many of these prophecies are described as originating in visions or in dreams, as in the vision of Ezekiel, or the visions of John on Patmos, on Jacob's vision of the ladder. These things seem to have been imposed upon man by a superior power for a particular purpose. And this purpose having been fulfilled, these prophets prophesy no more. That such a situation can be considered we do not doubt. Whether this actually means that the individual receives these admonitions from deity directly, or whether beneath the psychological layer of the human personality there is a truly spiritual core, and that what might be termed the great vision, the vision for the healing of nations, the vision of the restatement of basic truths which man must re-experience or perish, whether these very deep roots are not perhaps linked to the spiritual power of man himself, who as a being participating in the divine nature may also participate in the omniscience of that nature, which is the condition of a spiritual all-knowing. Here I again get into a little trouble, because immediately everyone is going to feel that his mystical experiences come right from that core. But usually, further searching indicates that this is optimism. The type of person or individual uh, that has these extremely powerful spiritual revelational experiences the type of person is nearly always strangely outstanding, strangely linked to destiny. And in this revelation that comes, also comes the dedication to the ministry of that need, a dedication that frequently leads to martyrdom and at least to years of patient and unselfish toil. The great vision comes to the dedicated person not to the individual of uncertain life and means. And if the vision does arise from these tremendous subjective depths of man's spiritual nature, this vision or this experience becomes, uh, for all purposes, an inevitable happening. The individual cannot resist it, and whatever it decrees, that he must do to the complete elimination of himself if necessary. Such a deep, profound insight can never be followed by trivial action, can never be followed by the individual merely telling it to his friends and then go on as he was before. This type seems to be a breaking through of consciousness for a destined purpose. And uh, this purpose is clear and continuous, and the consequences of it 
uh, are universally benevolent. So that we can't assume uh, that these experiences uh, that we have all arise from any such uh, deep root or condition. Now, those kinds of dreams which might normally or naturally arise from telepathy probably do arise from that form. And your extrasensory band will explain a number of dreams, such as the individual dreaming one night that his father is dying and receiving a telegram the next morning saying that the father has passed on. This type of dream is almost certain a psychical sympathy. It is the kind of strange rapport that we find among identical twins. Many ex explanations have been given. The two most valid ones, as far as I am able to consider, are first the psychic sympathy of blood. That this mysterious magnetic thing that we call blood is highly individual that it descends also in families that have a psychic rapport through the magnetic field of the blood, therefore have a certain contact with others involved in this blood descent. The second answer is that the psychic field of the individual is also a kind of blood, and that the psychic fields of persons related by blood or of great attachment of another kind, in which a powerful sympathy binds them together. This is the sympathetic concept of Paracelsus. That this powerful sympathy makes them aware of what occurs to each other. That each becomes aware of what occurs to the other. Now we may say many persons having such apparent sympathy are still not aware of these occurrences. Three children are involved when a parent dies. Two of them are not in the slightest aware. The third has a prophetic dream. The answer here seems to lie in the sensitivity of the one child and the ability of that child to interpret impulse into a dream phenomenon. A per perhaps a more psychic internal attachment than the others possess, or some peculiar relationship by which they were the ones who had the impression. Where, for instance, a thing of this nature occurs, it is almost certainly a problem of telepathy, or any dream that is based upon some form of knowing that depends upon someone else knowing or doing. Therefore, any dream which can be explained by a transference of thought is probably best considered on that level until we go further. But this explanation should not be held as dogmatic, for it is possible that in this so-called telepathic area of dreams there may be a dozen subdivisions with various factors involved in the transmission of the dream impulse. Clairvoyance also is different from thought transference, or the generally termed extrasensory band, in that it may possibly involve, and sometimes does involve, occurrences happening at a distance to which the individual has no known psychic relationship. The person, as in a dream, traveling in another land, may become aware of things happening in that land, or may see events which might not have any particular personal bearing. But if these events are occurring at the time of the dream, or the event follows the dream closely, then it is quite probable that such a relationship exists. If, however, the event has not occurred, if the event does not coincide with the dream, but still happens ultimately, then 
pure clairvoyance or the ability to see or to know a thing at a distance will not answer the question. Many of the American Indian medicine priests have the power, according to their own belief, and is testified to by the experiences of their people, of being able to locate game or to locate herds of animals at a distance. The old priest would simply, in his own terms, sit down, quietly meditate, and send his consciousness up and down the wilderness and find those herds. This, however, does not consist of a prophecy. Someone hearing him tell where the herd is later might say that he is prophesying that it will be there. What he has actually done, according to his own teaching, however, is that he has been there and seen it there. Therefore, that he has been able to project consciousness. This projection of consciousness may be consciously recorded not as a journey to the herd, but as a visualization of its location. It may come in a vision or in a dream. Most of the wisdom of the old priests, most of their instruction, most of their discoveries were recorded in the dream sequence form because the inward experience broke through to their outer consciousness in this way. The same is true of this type of dream as many other similar experiences, that they are most likely to be recorded in the interval between sleeping and waking. Man sleeping most heavily in the first two or three hours of rest is not so likely to have the visions occur or the dreams become consciously received during these first hours of heavy sleep. The most common time of the dream or the mystical or metaphysical experience is therefore near the end of the sleeping period, which would correspond to the early pre-dawn hours in the life of most persons. And the majority of mystical or meaningful dreams occur between about four in the morning and sunrise. During this time, the consciousness is sort of suspended between the sleep and waking state and is slowly drifting toward waking. And there is a neutral time, apparently, an equilibrium between sleeping and waking, during which the dream can be not only inwardly experienced, but the person retains an outward conscious awareness of the dream. Being somewhat awake, we are able to remember it. Being somewhat asleep, we are able to have it. And the combination is the recorded dream. Other dreams uh, probably were occurring during the deeper hours of sleep. But unless they are pressureful enough to break through and cause the person to awake, he is not likely to keep a very long record of them. This is probably also the reason why he has a tendency to forget them, unless they are peculiarly intense. Most dreams that have me unusual meaning, prophetic or otherwise, are repeated to indicate, apparently, that something should be done about them. The person receiving a dream of meaning to himself and not finding the meaning or not accepting the meaning or misinterpreting the meaning will very likely have the dream repeated. If, however, he fully grasps its significance and accepts it, the dream is not likely to be repeated. Consequently, if you think you have solved the dream, but you keep on having it, the chances are you have not solved it. But you have to approach it in a different way. Warning dreams can involve sometimes even physical accidents. They can warn the individual or cause him to almost visualize a state that is to arise in himself. But we have what are called accident-prone people. And this is something that, again, has never been thoroughly solved. But there is something that seems to indicate that even a so-called sudden accident emergency is not just merely a 
fortuitous and isolated incident. The accident-prone person has within himself a susceptibility to certain occurrences. This susceptibility is the result of some peculiar characteristic of his own nature. And the dream may frequently symbolize this proneness to a certain type of incident. I've known persons who have, were under a very heavy uh, problem of being accident prone, who have had as many as a dozen accidents in one day. They were none of them very serious. Maybe once the person hits the thumb with the hammer, perhaps a little later slipped and fell, a little later reached to an upper shelf and threw out a sacriliac, and so the day went. It was just one of those days people like to forget about. Yet this type of accident-prone sequence has a meaning. It has to arise in some symbolic pattern of personal intensity. The accident-prone person is at the time out of adequate control of his own reflexes. Therefore, he doesn't stop soon enough. He doesn't move slowly enough. He doesn't skillfully guide the nervous reflexes. He is out of the immediate integration of his own reflexes. Now, in the cases involving certain types of incidents in dreams, a chronic state of being out of control will produce a whole series of accident situations to which the individual is prone. The next day, if he gets better control of himself, he may find the tendency fade away. But all other things being equal, we know that the person who is nervous is most likely to be accident prone. And we know that the person who goes to sleep in a highly nervous state is going to have certain experiences more clearly than a person who sleeps in a relaxed condition. And nature, always trying to straighten things out, warns the sleeping person who is tense that he is in an accident-prone condition. And the dreams may take the form of accident. Perhaps the accidents in the dream do not take place. But the accident tendency will cause other occurrences that can later be psychologically, symbolically associated with the dream. A man rushing headlong down the street in the dream comes suddenly to the end of the road and falls off into a vast depth in which he struggles hopelessly and finally wakens in a cold sweat. Nature is telling this individual that his psychological procedure is panic, that he is rushing headlong into a situation. Now, what the situation may be may have nothing to do with a paving situation or the end of a street, but nature is reminding him that his tension can cause him to fall into disaster. Nature gives him these continuous warnings Nature will give the alcoholic warning. Delirium tremens are a form of such warning, namely that the alcoholism has reached an acute state, and if something is not done, it will threaten both the mind and the physical health. But the warning comes in the form of seeing something that isn't there. Now, it is not when man under alcoholism dreams of the proverbial snakes that Riley saw, according to the poems of James Whitcomb Riley, it does not mean that the person with this dream is going to be bitten by a snake. It means that his alcohol tolerance has been exceeded, and that therefore the dream is symbolical of a situation that is destroying him. The symbolism takes traditional or mystical form, but the warning dream always warns us 
that in some way we are out of integration and that the continuance of this faith will prove disaster. There are very few persons who ever dream of dying. They may dream of being dead, but not of dying. Very few persons in dreaming of a disaster remain asleep until the disaster is consummated. Usually the struggle to save themselves at the last minute wakens them, and they are never quite certain as to the outcome of the dream. This again is prodromic, that the individual who becomes awake escapes the vicious or disastrous pressure of the dream. The dream is therefore, by its own nature, never fatalistic. It is, however, powerfully indicative. indicative. It tells us what may happen, but it does not complete the incident as far as our own experience is concerned, always appearing to imply that if the individual who is passing through a dream tragedy can struggle into the state of awakeness he can dissipate the nightmare. He can get out of the situation, which is a highly involved psychic pattern. Therefore, nature is telling us always, when we want to get away from some dismal or horrible situation, wake up. For the very process of waking breaks the strange tension of the dream. In the same way, the process of waking becomes the process of awareness, of suddenly being certain of certain things, understanding them, knowing them, becoming awake to our own mistakes, awake to our own folly, awake to our own needs. When we wake up from a mistake, we also break the pattern. And all, nearly all prophetic dreams bearing upon the life of the individual if they are of the nightmare quality, involve this escape by awaking, which is almost a statement of philosophy. It is truly a statement of Buddhism, that the dream becomes the symbol of the entire mirage of existence, from which the individual awakes, and in awaking escapes from the tyranny of psychic process. All these things mean that certain dreams Many dreams have meaning, but many dreams in general indicate the direction of events, that some are derived from certain clairvoyant factors, others from telepathic factors, others perhaps from an acute judgment, some being also the pressure of our own eternal and inevitable self-demand some being the stamping of the psychic nature's own directive upon our lives, some the meaning of ourselves coming through to us, others in turn the obvious effort to point out that a direction, if continued, will prove fatal. All of these various aspects can arise from the different levels of our own consciousness and involve also faculties and perceptions beyond our present general acceptance. Thus the sleep dream phenomena is not as simple, I do not think, as many people believe it to be. There is much more to be learned, but it is always wise to assume meaning where the probabilities of meaning exist and from meaning to answer the question, if we can, what does it mean to me now? Why did it happen to me just at this time? And what does it tell me that I should know in order to prevent the fulfillment of the negative aspect of the dream itself? The dream indicates that there is a negative factor at work in, at work in life if the dream is morbid. Therefore, this factor must be found and corrected. And the psychological fact remains that when it is corrected, the dream ceases. Therefore, it has served its purpose. And to discover the purpose is to erase 
the repetition of the dream or its morbid implication. So these things we all have to work with, and uh, a little self-analysis and study may produce not only interesting results, but actually will enlarge the general knowledge of the field so that each person in this area, because it is not well developed, can make personal discoveries that have meaning and can perhaps ultimately assist in the directing of the, the research mind into the channels necessary for the fuller explanation of dream phenomena. Time is up, so I guess that's all for now.